Good afternoon. My name is uh, Tom LeCur. Um, I'm on the Learning and Retirement Committee. I'm an emeritus professor of history. Uh, and today I'm introducing my wonderful and uh, learned colleague, uh, Brian DeLay. Um, all of his work is interesting. Um, he began his career working on history of indigenous peoples. Um, his first book is called War of a Thousand Deserts. Indian raids in the U.S.-Mexican War, um, which won uh, several uh, several prizes. It was a finalist for the Frank Francis Parkman Prize, um, and he also wrote a, he's written many articles on on um, on indigenous politics. Um, the subject, but say it's novel but he, he he understands indigenous politics and culture as part of u.s history in a way that that few people did but that's not why we invited him here today he's been working um for a very long time uh on the history of the united states and the international gun trade in fact not just the united states the united states in relation to the to the whole to the whole new world and um in particular he's written a very long and important article for a law review on the history of regulation of of weapons of magazines of bullets and of um, um basically the whole the whole regulatory regime in this country over 200 years and in light of the Bruin decision in which the supreme court held that um historical evidence is 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 the sine qua non of interpreting what regulations do and don't um, um pass muster uh that work is um is, is central uh, and as he told me once in a, in a conversation um the brood may be good or bad uh for the regulatory regimes but it's very good for historians who work on who work on their history so um i'm enormously pleased that that brian's would uh, as we talk to us and i look forward to what he has to say brian there he is <laughs> okay. In his Grinnell office. <laughs> That's right. I, I, I'm right here in the Grinnell. Um, so thank you very much, Tom, for the for the invitation and um, for the, the introduction. And thank you to all of you for taking time today. Uh, it's an honor to speak with you. Um, I'm going to try to do two things in my comments today. First, I'm going to offer some background about recent Supreme Court rulings, recent being the last 15 years or so on firearms, and explain why those rulings have made history and historians uh, so relevant to gun law. And after that, I'll explain what I see as the main differences between gun culture in the late 18th century, around the time of the ratification of the Second Amendment, and gun culture in our own day. Uh, and then I'll conclude very briefly with some thoughts about what all this might mean for our understanding of the Second Amendment. And I'm hopeful that all this together will illuminate the question in the title of my talk, what did the founders think guns were for? So let me begin with the Supreme Court cases. I know that this is probably familiar ground for many of you, but it's such important context that I wanna start here. Um, so in 2008, for the first time, the Supreme Court declared that the Second Amendment protected an individual right to possess firearms. This was, of course, in its decision um, in District of Columbia v. Heller. Two years later, in 2010, the court held that states and municipalities were obliged to abide by this novel interpretation of gun rights, um, arguing that the 14th Amendment incorporated the Second Amendment uh, at all jurisdictional levels. So these two rulings set the stage for New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin in 2022, the summer of 2022. And in that decision, the court declared a right to carry firearms outside the home to be an individually and uh, an individually held fundamental right. So if that were the only thing Bruin did, it would have been a big deal. But what really makes Bruin so radical and so consequential isn't even this very important finding about carrying firearms. What makes Bruin so important is the novel framework that the ruling introduced for assessing the constitutionality of all firearms regulations. Bruin invalidated the two-part framework that uh, for deciding Second Amendment cases 
that had been more or less universally adopted by the federal circuit courts in the years after Bruin, so the years between 2008 and 2022. Under that earlier framework, courts first looked to the Second Amendment's history, text, and tradition to determine whether a regulation impinged on a protected right. And then if they found that a regulation did impinge on a protected right, courts then applied one of the traditional tiers of constitutional scrutiny, uh, which ask about the government's interest and how important a challenge regulation is in furthering that interest. So another simpler way to put this is that hell in the Heller era, courts balanced history, text, and tradition on the one hand with public interest on the other hand when they were considering firearms laws. So what makes Bruin so radical is that Bruin tossed out the public interest part of that framework. It insisted that lower courts begin deciding Second Amendment cases entirely on the basis of history, text, and tradition. State and local limitations on an individual's right to keep and bear arms are now uh, to be considered constitutional only if they are consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearms regulation. There's no other branch of constitutional law where history has become so central uh, or so contested as in Second Amendment litigation. Now, Bruin has encouraged opponents of firearms regulation across the country to pay even closer attention to early America than they had before. And they really like what they don't see. So the ruling makes historical evidence, or more to the point, the absence of historical evidence dispositive. Laws restricting concealed carry permits to those who can demonstrate good cause, for example, or laws requiring buyers to be at least 21 years of age before purchasing a handgun, or laws disarming felons or laws disarming persons under restraining orders for domestic violence, um, or laws limiting the maximum size of detachable magazines, or laws requiring that those who assemble firearms from kits have federal serial numbers affixed to those weapons. All of those are really hard to find in early American um, legal history. And according to the most pro-gun rights interpretation of the Bruin uh, standard, if Americans had no such regulations in 1791, or maybe in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified, then we can't have them either. I don't think that most Americans have yet come to grips with the implications of this ruling, the really profound implications of this ruling. They're getting underway. They're coming into view only now. Nearly every firearms law currently on the books is new is uh, newly vulnerable to constitutional challenge as a consequence of this law. And the exultant leaders of gun rights organizations across the country here in California and elsewhere are making really bold predictions about overturning virtually every firearms restriction on the books today. That kind of prediction may seem premature. Uh, but Bruin undeniably heralds a new and accelerating era of change in uh, national and state and local gun law. I'll just give you a couple um, factoids to back that up. Second Amendment civil challenges prevailed 15% of the time in the first eight years after Heller. So, you know, in those first eight years, Second Amendment civil challenges only succeeded 15% of the time, not that often. But in the years since Bruin, Second Amendment civil challenges have succeeded at more than twice that rate. Uh, a recent study identifies 81 Second Amendment civil claims adjudicated in the 12 months after Bruin uh, was announced, and 40% of them prevailed. So, the nation has embarked on a momentous reconsideration of gun regulations and the distant past is the primary field of contention. And this is where historians come in. The Bruin decision reassured judges that they are not expected to engage in historical research themselves. Rather, they are, quote, entitled to decide a case based on the historical record compiled by the parties. Crucially, though, it's the state that bears the evidentiary burden 
plaintiffs don't have to come to court and prove that contemporary laws are inconsistent with historic laws. States have to prove that contemporary laws are consistent with historic laws. And that means that offices of attorneys general across the country are, you know, who are scrambling to defend um, um, established or new laws are turning to professional historians with expertise in 18th and 19th century firearms and the role of firearms in American life. Um, and as it turns out, this is a pretty tiny field. There's just not that many historians who have been working on that um, topic. I'm one of them. Um, you know, in I've been working on the history of the international arms trade for about 15 years. And in my whole time doing that work, I was never once approached by any party to a Second Amendment case. Uh, but since Bruin, so since last October, almost exactly a year from now, um, or a year since you know, before today, I, I've been recruited as an expert witness uh, by authorities defending firearms regulations in Washington, D.C., in Oregon, both for a state case and a federal case, in Illinois, in Washington State, uh, in California, in New Jersey, in Delaware, and in Colorado. Um, and there's others that I've had to turn down because I just didn't have the bandwidth. So I've had a lot of exposure to the arguments um, that plaintiffs and their allies make in these cases. Uh, all the cases that I've been involved in so far are cases involving limitations on assault rifles, um, pardon me, assault weapons or high capacity magazines or ghost guns. So a kind of particular um, slice of firearms law. Uh, but what has most struck me um, reading these arguments over and over and over again, and often engaging with the same experts on the other side, case after case after case, is the strained insistence on historic continuity. No one, I don't think, who seriously studies guns in 18th century American life can fail to appreciate the profound differences between then and now. But opponents of firearms regulation intone a myth of continuity in American gun culture. The myth of continuity takes various forms depending on the regulation that needs overturning. So I'll give you an example. Arguing against limitations on large capacity magazines and assault weapons, plaintiffs and their allies here in California and in many states across the country have rummaged through a shared compendium of exotic historic firearms, many literally drawn from a, um, a 1955 book entitled Firearms Curiosa, in search of evidence for the antiquity of repeating firearms. And equipped with these examples that they've, they've uh, extracted from various sources, they advance a three-part argument. And I'm, I'm gonna quote from these, uh, these complaints uh, in order to give you a flavor of the arguments that are being uh, advanced in federal courts. First, that, quote, magazines capable of holding more than 10 rounds predate the Second Amendment and were known to and embraced by the founders, end quote. Second, that, quote, no regulations from around the time of the adoption of the Second or the 14th Amendments limited the ammunition capacity of firearms. And third, given Bruin's insistence that, quote, only historical tradition can remove a firearm from Second Amendment's protected scope, such regulations are unconstitutional today. The, this myth of continuity, it's, it's highly adaptable. I've shared with you, you know, the specifics, some of the specifics about a particular kind of case, but this basic argument, this three-part argument is being deployed in cases all around the country. And you know, in the abstract, that argument can be simplified as A, X firearms related issue has persisted since the late 18th century at least, B, the founders did little or nothing about it, and C, therefore we can't do anything about it either. That's the basic framework here. And again, it's showing up in all kinds of gun law cases across the country. At its most general, there is a premise here. The premise is that um, America has a stable gun culture that dates back into the colonial era. Then and now, um, proponents of this narrative assert Americans wanted and used guns for the same or very similar reasons. And while the myth acknowledges that firearms have evolved, um, it insists that guns in the late 18th century were sufficiently analogous to guns in our own time 
to have provoked similar societal concern. So as two pioneers of this myth of continuity put it in a 2007 law review article, quote, it is certainly true that firearms technology has advanced since 1791, but not as much as some would like to think in italics. So according to figures such as these, what really changed um, is not so much the guns, not so much the reasons Americans wanted guns, and not even what their owners did with guns or the resulting social consequences. Those aren't the things that have changed. What has really changed is law. Modern policymakers have broken with tradition by seeking to regulate weapons that the founders in their wisdom opted not to. Regulation is the great discontinuity, in other words, and regulation has to be overturned in this narrative. Now, the myth of continuity's perniciousness, or its promise, depending on your point of view, comes from the way that it confidently projects our modern experience with guns and gun violence back onto the late 18th century. That projection has helped remake Second Amendment jurisprudence over the past 15 years with really dramatic consequences. Um, most consequentially, uh, this is what happened with Heller and Heller's ahistorical premise that pistols played a similar role in crime and self-defense, particularly urban crime and self-defense in 1791, as they did in urban crime and self-defense in 2008. Um, and that's just not true. You know, in fact, only a tiny percentage of Americans owned pistols in 1791. And as far as we can tell, they were very seldom used in violent crime as such. So Bruin's framework ensures that the myth of continuity, this myth that I'm suggesting has been present and been a kind of a rocket fuel for this transformation in Second Amendment jurisprudence since before Heller, well, Bruin from 2022 ensures that the myth of continuity is going to figure even more prominently into regulatory battles going forward. And that's true not only because of the primacy that the decision affords history, but also because of how it directs courts to approach regulatory silence. And here briefly, I just need to get quick into the weeds, just very briefly um, about a particular feature of the decision that is really consequential for the role that history is playing in these debates. The court in the Bruin decision, um, Justice Thomas, who wrote the opinion, <clears throat> distinguished between cases that it presumes will or will not be fairly straightforward. Uh, so there's two kinds of cases. In the first category, the straightforward, the ostensibly straightforward cases, are those involving regulations that address a general societal problem that has persisted since the 18th century, end quote, continuity. Uh, in such cases, the absence of distinctly similar historic regulation addressing that problem is relevant evidence that the challenged regulation is inconsistent with the Second Amendment. So in other words, a straightforward case under Bruin's framework is one featuring an enduring societal problem involving firearms. And if that problem went unregulated by the founders, then it is presumed to be constitutionally immune from regulation today. Cases expected to be something other than straightforward, so the second category of cases, are those involving what the opinion calls, quote, unprecedented societal concerns or dramatic technological changes. Unprecedented societal concerns or dramatic technological changes. That ends up being an extremely significant phrase um, in current court battles unfolding across the country. According to the opinion, those kinds of cases, quote, may require a more nuanced approach necessitating analogical reasoning to determine how and why the regulations burden a law abiding citizen's right to armed self-defense. So given that this second more nuanced approach opens up more avenues for defending regulation, a lot depends on whether courts can be convinced that a firearms related problem has persisted since the late 18th century. So opponents of gun regulations have more incentive than ever to argue for continuity in American gun culture. And this is the reason that I'm arguing that the myth of continuity is going to be even more consequential for firearms law in the future than it has been over the past 15 years. <clears throat> 
what is usually at stake in arguments in these cases for continuity is the vital question of why we find regulatory silences in the historical record. After all, legislation responds to felt needs. Uh, historic context is essential to fully understanding those needs, or even to begin to understand those needs. States defending firearms law in the Bruin era will often need to provide that historical context in order to rebut the myth of continuity that's put forward by plaintiffs and their allies. And a lot hinges on whether or not states are able to do that. By way of illustration, um, by way of illustrating this matter of how important context is and how courts might interpret um, cases put before them, uh, I'm going to I'm going to offer an analogy. It's an, al an analogy that I've used in um, most of the cases that I've worked on, and it involves jetpacks. So jetpacks are unregulated technology today, um, but they have intrigued militaries and the public for more than a hundred years. And that interest has generated competition in research and development. Nonetheless, most of us today know that jetpacks remain an expensive and experimental curiosity uh, in our own times. And most of us know that that's probably because of stubborn technological problems, safety concerns, and practical challenges, including cost. But imagine a scenario where a jurist 232 years in the future is presented with a shrewdly curated version of this context, this context that's more or less common knowledge today, but maybe wouldn't be in 232 years. Confronted only with documentary evidence that a patent was taken out on the jetpack design as early as 1919, which it was, um, that militaries remained intrigued by the technology throughout the 20th and into the 21st century, and that the jetpack commanded enduring popular interest. And here you can imagine any number of movies or television shows serving as exhibits. That future jurist might be persuaded that the absence of regulation reflected an ideological disposition against regulating jetpacks in the early 21st century. But you know, of course, a simpler and more accurate explanation would be that jetpacks remained too flawed and too rare to attract regulatory attention in 2023. So to sum up this first part of my talk here, um, let me just explain that much of the work that I've done over the past year has been trying to make the case that repeating firearms or large capacity firearms or so-called assault weapons, these were the jetpacks of the founding era. They were intriguing, expensive, dangerous curiosities that attracted interest and even attracted paying crowds, as I discovered. But they produced, they, that is to say, multi-fire weapons, assault weapons, high capacity firearms. They produced no social consequences in the 18th century and unsurprisingly attracted no regulatory attention. Explaining why repeating firearms were the jetpacks of the founding era, however, requires answers to a bunch of practical questions about historic technologies and their social, uh, military, and regulatory consequences. So, you know, it, it requires answers to really, in, in many ways, banal questions like how well did repeating firearms work in the 18th and the 19th centuries? Were they reliable? Were they effective? Were they safe to shoot? How were they made? Uh, how many were made? How widely did they circulate? What were they used for? Um, and then you know, more concretely, doing this kind of work begs certain sorts of questions that you know, uh, are important to put before the court. So for example, if, as plaintiffs have claimed, large capacity weapons were actually well known to and embraced by the founders, why then did the founders fight their revolution without them? Indeed, why did the United States military rely overwhelmingly on single shot firearms in every war it fought between the ratification of the second and the 14th amendments? So Bruin requires states and the historians that they work with to advance these sorts of detailed historical arguments and questions and answers um, uh, to a high degree of detail that are always specific to the individual laws 
in question. And it's fundamentally a reactive process. The uh, plaintiffs challenge a law and then it's the state's burden to recruit experts to help it contextualize these laws. Um, but outside the confines of individual challenges, it's possible to step back and critique the myth of continuity at a more global level. Uh, and that's what I'd like to do in the second part of my talk here today. In at least one important regard, the continuity argument um, rings true. Like residents of the United States today, um, white British North Americans, at any rate, in the 18th century, owned a lot of guns. That's true. Uh, compared to most colonists elsewhere around the hemisphere and compared to their counterparts in Great Britain, white residents of the 13 colonies were remarkably well armed. Careful sa samples of probate inventories from 1774, not done by me, not by, done by other uh, historians, suggest that on average, about half of all white households possessed a firearm. That meant that guns were considerably more abundant than Bibles in late 18th century North America. All told, the 13 colonies might have had as many as 150,000 or 200,000 firearms on hand um, by the eve of the American Revolution, which um, in, in just in terms of raw numbers at the upper end would have been enough to equip about a third of all adult white men. So given the context of the day, and given what prevailed in other societies, this is a, a remarkably well-armed society. So in that sense, um, the argument for continuity does ring true. But once we begin to inquire into why early America had so many guns and how those motivations to have guns shaped patterns of gun ownership over time, well, then the gulf between our own times and their times begins to come into view. So let me try to explain that. Why were British North Americans so well armed compared to their contemporaries? Well, they were so well armed because of reasons distinct to their times. Whereas our own present day gun culture is consumerist, individualist, and state phobic, gun culture in 18th century British North America was utilitarian, collective, and state led. So I'm just going to say that again because I'm going to be leaning on this um, framework uh, somewhat in this part of the talk. So again, today, our present day gun culture, I submit, is consumerist, individualist, and state phobic. And gun culture in the late 18th century was utilitarian, collective, and state led. So consider some features of contemporary gun culture in order, uh, by way of me trying to substantiate this claim. One of the most prominent features of today's gun culture is the guns association with rural America and with hunting. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up in a house with a lot of guns. My dad was a hunter and an NRA member. And at that time, American gun culture was very strongly associated with um, hunting in particular and sort of a, a rural romance in general. This is less true now for reasons we can talk about in Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, but this is still a strain in American gun culture and, and the conception of, of uh, the gun community in the United States today. And here the continuity with 18th century America superficially at least seems strong. Um, 18th century America, this is an era where rural farming families comprise about 95% of the settler population in North America. Um, and in that kind of a context, firearms were useful and sometimes indispensable tools for everyday life. They were required for fowling, um, for hunting big game. They were very handy for keeping pests from crops and homes. Um, and guns are obviously put to similar uses in parts of the United States by some people today. But the proportions here are smaller than one might suppose. So only about 14% of Americans now live in rural areas in the United States and only about 4% hunt. So even this superficial similarity, one that kind of intuitively seems like something that would be a through line, is actually quite different. Another conspicuous feature of our contemporary gun culture is the degree to which arms are prized and heavily marketed consumer goods. 
for a small minority of wealthy colonial buyers, finely made, even decorated arms could be valued um, in pleasing material possessions. They, they could be objects to take care of and even to pass down uh, to inheritors. So in that sense, there's a similarity. But the extreme rarity in the 18th century of the large firearms collections that are so crucial to the flourishing of today's arms industry in the United States is another metric of discontinuity. A landmark 2016 study from researchers at Harvard and Northeastern University found that today's so-called super owners, the 3% of Americans who for reasons of collecting or prepping or both own the most guns, that 3% of Americans possess roughly half of all privately held firearms in the country. It's such an astonishing number. I want to say that again, that 3% of Americans, according to the study, possess roughly half of all privately held firearms in the country. Contrast that with the colonial era. Um, there's a really wonderful historian, early American historian named Kevin Sweeney, who is completing what is going to be the uh, most comprehensive study ever of firearms in 18th century America. And according to Sweeney's painstaking work in probate records, um, only 4.5% of male probate inventories contained more than three firearms. Only 1.4% contained more than five firearms. Um, and rather than aficionados or preppers, um, as is the case today, most of the tiny number of early Americans who were the super owners of their day had entirely practical utilitarian reasons for having these large collections of firearms, for having private arsenals. More than two thirds of those in Sweeney sample who owned six or more guns. So again, we're talking about a small percentage of the total population, but more than two thirds of those who did own more than six or more guns were Southern slaveholders. All 10 of the probate inventories um, in Sweeney's sample that contained 10 or more guns, all 10 of them belonged to South Carolinian planters who ran vast slave labor enterprises, averaging 95 enslaved laborers each. So these were not only among the very richest people in the entire continent, these were also people um, who were engaged in a coercive project that made it absolutely mandatory that they have a significant firearms advantage. So Americans of the late 18th century would have found, I submit, today's hyper-commercialized and ideologically charged culture of consuming and stockpiling guns, I think they would have found this deeply alien and strange. Over the past generation, a concern with self-defense has become central to contemporary gun culture. Um, and this is a shift that the firearms industry is very skillfully encouraged through its advertising campaigns. This increasing focus on self-defense is also at the heart of recent Second Amendment jurisprudence. But crime and self-defense in the sense of attacks on or protection against other members of one's own society, these are weak explanations for colonial gun ownership. Prior to the widespread availability of breech-loading weapons and metallic cartridges in the mid 19th century, firearms were awkward tools, either for the perpetrating or the resisting of crimes of passion. Um, firearms at the time were notoriously inaccurate at range. They were um, very liable to misfire and they had to be muzzle loaded either with gunpowder and ball before every shot um, or um, by packing in a pre-made paper cartridge. And it's usually something only militaries did. So either way, this is a laborious process. It takes time and focus. Moreover, such guns were seldom kept loaded and at the ready for any extended period of time because black powder corroded iron barrels so quickly. So if you cared about your weapon, you weren't gonna leave it, leave it loaded for any significant amount of time. So partly for these reasons, firearms usually played a relatively small role in murders between white people in North America before the era of the Civil War. Randolph Roth, a, a sociologist and historian and the nation's foremost scholar of the history of homicide in North America, has argued that rates of gun homicide in the continent rose and fell in step with political instability and especially with shifts in faith in government, justice and social hierarchy. So as a quick sidebar, I think 
Randolph Roth's findings about the history of homicide should give all of us a chill down our spine. But uh, to get back to the topic here, when the overall homicide rate was low, according to Roth's scholarship, guns were used only in about 10 to 15% of homicides. I'll just say that one more time. When the overall homicide rate was low, guns were used in only 10 to 15% of homicides. During periods of political instability before the Civil War, however, firearms could be used more frequently. They could be used as often in the kind of the extreme cases in as many as 30 to 40% of all homicides. And that's very space, uh, place and time specific, that finding. That's the high water mark. But even those unusual circumstances look different from our own times when, you know, as late or as late as um, recently as 2020, which is the last year I could find data for this, nearly 80% of all homicides in the United States involve a firearm. So neither consumerism nor fear of crime are adequate explanations for British North America's unusually high rates of firearms ownership. That given, what are compelling? explanations. Well, freedom from restrictive laws provides a partial answer. Um, even in the least armed parts of British North America, gun ownership seems to have been more than twice as common as it was in mid 18th century England, for example. Um, there in mid 18th century England, there were laws criminalizing hunting and gun ownership for all but a relatively um, tiny slice of the population. And colonists in British North America faced no such barriers to using guns for hunting or for pest control. And so they did use them at, at a much higher rates. Even so, that fact, the basic freedom to use these guns cannot explain the great variability in gun ownership across time and across space in North America, which is the next thing I wanna tell you about. To explain that variation, we need to center other explanations. And I think most importantly, we need to center slavery, settler colonialism, and inter-imperial war. In the first instance, firearms were absolutely necessary for the two systematic forms of violent predation that preoccupied generations of European colonists, dispossessing native people of their land and terrorizing and enslaving people of African descent. Um, you know, just for context, uh, in 1775, people of African descent amounted to almost a fifth of the entire population. So it's a very significant undertaking. As those 10 rich South Carolinian enslavers I mentioned a moment ago understood very well, neither of these projects, neither settler colonialism nor certainly slavery would have been possible without a yawning weapons gap. Some modern activists and writers and jurists who are seeking a continuous American gun culture have tried to ennoble these imperatives by gathering them under the banner of self-defense. Um, to take one kind of notorious example, during oral arguments in Heller, Justice Anthony Kennedy asked whether the second clause in the Second Amendment, quote, had nothing to do with the concern of the remote settler to defend himself and his family against hostile Indian tribes and outlaws, wolves and bears and grizzlies and things like that. Now it's true that colonists terrorizing and exploiting enslaved people and settlers encroaching on native land, often in violation of British law, had reason to fear their victims and therefore had reason to be armed. But these colonists needed guns not so much for self-defense as for collective offense. And I think it's a very important distinction, right? They needed arms so that they and their white neighbors working cooperatively could safely take what they wanted from black and from indigenous people. Many colonists also needed to be well-armed on account of imperial rivals. Warfare between Western Europe's great powers provoked warfare in the Americas over and over uh, again during the colonial era. Given the vastness of imperial claims, the vulnerability of scattered frontier settlements, uh, and the relatively small size of imperial armies in the colonial period, colonists inevitably found themselves recruited into formal or informal military service in ways that have only a tiny portion of the public in the United States today can relate to. Conflict between Spain, France, and Britain also magnified the risks of slavery and settler colonialism, 
And that's because European powers in times of war sought advantage by arming and otherwise empowering their enemies, enemies, that is to say their enemies, victims, enslaved people and native people. And that's what happens during King William's War between 1689 and 1697. It happens between in, during Queen Anne's War, 1702 to 1713, King George's War, 1744 to 1748. And especially it happens during the Seven Years' War between 1754 and 1763. More than 100,000 men from the British colonies served alongside British regular forces in North America in these conflicts, and that required periodic weapon shipments from the metropole. Um, other colonists in the Americas obviously consumed guns too. They consumed guns for hunting uh, and dealing with pests. They um, consumed guns because they were also engaged in the predations of slavery and settler colonialism. They consumed guns because they were anxious about inter-imperial war. So it's not, I'm not arguing that in British North America, British North America was the only place where one finds these things. What I'm arguing is that British North America, with the possible exception of um, New France, was the place where these three imperatives came together with the most consistency and the most urgency of anywhere in the Americas. And partly for that reason, nowhere else in the Americas was the state so energetic in its attempts to arm such a large percentage of its colonial population. Today, we associate state regulation of firearms with various kinds of limitations on private ownership, right? So um, firearms regulation means limitation. In the colonial era, state regulation was far more likely to encourage and even to mandate private gun ownership among a particular group than it was to restrict it. The most consequential firearms regulations um, of the era concerned militias. These were the formal, compulsory, selective, state-sanctioned organizations through which colonists undertook most martial activities. And as another quick aside, um, the term militia is another source of some confusion in contemporary debates about firearms and proponents um, of eliminating firearms restrictions often assert and seem to believe that militias were basically any group of, of people with guns that had some kind of a shared purpose. That's absolutely not how it worked in the colonial period. These were selective, state-organized, state-sanctioned, and state-run organizations. Um, now, colonial authorities passed hundreds of militia laws before the revolution. These were laws that mandated how these armed bodies were to be constituted, how they were to be mobilized, how they were to be led um, and disciplined, and how they were to be equipped. Research in probate records makes it clear that government exerted a very powerful influence on the geography of gun ownership in the British colonies, and that it did so primarily through the mechanism of militia laws. Gun ownership was highest in those colonies where governments energetically encouraged and supported militia service. These were places where slavery, settler colonialism, and or nearby imperial rivals provoked security concerns. In such places, colonial authorities mandated gun ownership, and in times of heightened anxiety, they took steps to equip militiamen who lacked their own arms. So let me just give you a few examples here. In the mid 17th century New England, for example, with its violently expanding frontier and its robust militia tradition, nearly 70% of male probate inventories included a firearm. Ownership rates were nearly as high in the Chesapeake. In late 17th century Virginia, where anxious authorities restricted militia service to property owners, so they didn't have a universal militia, they had a select militia. Um, but while they restricted um, militia service to property owners, they took an active role in making sure that those property owners were equipped with firearms. The state would provide them if they didn't have them themselves. And in Virginia, under those circumstances, firearms likewise appear in about 70% of male probate inventories. South Carolina is kind of the extreme example here. Um, South Carolina was uniquely vulnerable. Not only did it have an enslaved majority, which was a constant unceasing existential threat to um, the white oppressor class in, in, in the colony. But South Carolina also shared borders with 
the mighty Creek and Cherokee nations to its west. And before the establishment of Georgia, South Carolina also shared a frontier with Spanish Florida. So South Carolina had more reason than any state to make sure that its population, white population, was armed, and it did so. It had the highest rates of firearms ownership anywhere in the colonies. Um, and um, it even went so far as to arm arming enslaved men in times of conflict and emergency. So you can take these places that have relatively high rates of firearms ownership and contrast them with places that have lower rates of firearms ownership. For example, in the mid-Atlantic region. Mid-Atlantic colonies with weak or non-existent militia traditions usually had far lower rates of gun ownership. Dutch and English New Yorkers, for example, were accustomed to relying upon uh, professional military and upon native allies for their security. And they owned fewer firearms than their counterparts in the North or in the South. Um, their firearms appear in just over half of late 17th century inventories and in barely more than a third of the inventories by the 18th, mid 18th century. In Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Delaware, where they had relatively few enslaved laborers, no nearby imperial rivals. And until the mid 18th century, they had relatively peaceful relations with indigenous neighbors pacifist Quaker proprietors repressed militias, didn't allow militias during most of the colonial era. And so as a result, here again, only about a third of Pennsylvania's probate inventories contained firearms um, before independence. So in other words, the uneven geography of gun ownership in British North America, both over space and over time, um, can help us understand why colonists had guns in addition to who had them and where. Colonial British North America had a robust gun culture, but it was very different from the one that prevails today. The shifting and uneven geography of ownership reveals a utilitarian and collective gun culture powerfully and actively shaped by the state. Encouraged and assisted by the metropole and by colonial governments, British North Americans kept arms for the purpose of responding to collective opportunities and collective threats. When the imperatives and dangers associated with these opportunities and these threats relaxed, gun ownership declined. Massachusetts militiamen were very well armed, as I said a moment ago, um, in the late 18th century, around the decades before Medicom's War, also known as King Philip's War, between 1675 and 1678. Um, that war devastated Southern New England's indigenous polities and basically eliminated those polities as a significant security threat to the settlers in Massachusetts. So by the 1740s, as a consequence, um, Massachusetts militia really struggled to arm itself in the crisis of King George's War because it simply didn't have the same imperatives at, at work. Um, now, the state played an enormous role, as I've already said multiple times, I really wanna emphasize that point here, um, uh, and try to drive it home now. The state played a huge role in these shifting patterns of gun ownership, not only through militia regimes that were specific to individual colonies, but also through the primary source of firepower, which is the imperial metropole. Settler colonialism required arms and ammunition distributed by the state. It wasn't possible otherwise. Slavery required arms and ammunition distributed by the state. And war making on any scale, um, relatively small frontier conflicts to sprawling multi-continental inter-imperial wars, they all required arms and ammunition distributed by the state. Take the Seven Years' War, which Britain waged against France, Spain, and a shifting coalition of indigenous nations in the 1750s and 60s. British war planners knew that um, much of the sort of decisive fighting in that war was going to take place in North America, and that they needed to recruit tens of thousands of their North American colonists for that conflict. But these same war planners found that most of these British North Americans were either unwilling or unable to muster into service with an appropriate firearm. As a consequence, London shipped more than 66,000 military muskets to the colonies between 1756 and 1763. And that sudden infusion of firepower probably represented almost a 50% increase in the number of guns available in North America, um, British North America. 
while thousands of these arms are going to remain in colonial storehouses or crown arsenals once the war ends, it seems that a majority of them actually left with the colonists who mustered out of service once the war was over. Most immediately, the founding generation thought about firearms in the state not in relation to the imperial wars of previous decades, but in terms of their own formative experience in the American Revolution. No one who had any role in that war harbored any illusions that insurgents with their privately held weapons were in a position to fight Great Britain and win a war. Um, it's true, as I've mentioned already, colonists were well armed by the standards of the day, but they were woefully under equipped for a war against Great Britain. State power closed that gap. Um, everyone in the founding generation understood that victory in the revolution had been armed in the first instance by local insurgent committees purchasing as quasi governmental entities, purchasing whatever they could and confiscating the arms of political opponents. Um, it had been armed by colonial assemblies who partnered with prominent merchants to scour the Caribbean for markets, uh, Caribbean markets for muskets and gunpowder. It had been armed by the Continental Congress, which oversaw a very sophisticated and sprawling international program to import guns and ammunition. And ultimately it had been armed by the generous patronage of foreign governments, most especially France and Spain. So contra the myth of continuity, in summary, American gun culture in the late colonial era was profoundly different from American gun culture in the 21st century. This historic gun culture was utilitarian rather than uh, consumerist. It was collective rather than individualist, and it was state-led rather than state-phobic. This interpretation can shed light on the question in the title of my talk today, I hope. Uh, what did the founders think guns were for? Well, you know, guns are and were uh, commodities, right? They're durable goods, they're stores of material value, they're signs and symbols, um, and they're tools used for a wide variety of practical uses. So all that given the founders obviously and certainly would have thought that guns were for lots of things. But in terms of political and social life, I'm convinced that above all, the founders regarded guns as utilitarian tools for managing collective threats and opportunities under state supervision, or at least with state sanction. Now, in the few minutes that I have left, I just wanna step back and reflect on um, what these significant discontinuities in 18th century gun culture from 21st century gun culture can tell us about the Second Amendment. As a reminder, the amendments text reads this way. It says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The Heller majority interpreted these words to protect an individual right to armed self-defense. And scholars at the time thought that was a mistake. My own view, having worked on these cases for the last year and worked on the history of the international arms trade for the last 15 years is that the Heller decision was poorly decided and that it misinterpreted this, um, these, this language and that the Second Amendment is not designed, was not designed to protect an individual right to arm self-defense. The vital context for the crafting and the ratification of the Second Amendment is the anxiety, was the anxiety that the new constitution um, provoked about the balance of power between the federal government and the state government. So that's the essential context to understanding the uh, crafting and the ratification of the Second Amendment. After prolonged controversy and argument, Article One, Section 8 of the new constitution had just secured to the new federal government sweeping powers over state militias. Congress was empowered to, quote, provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the union, suppress insurrections and repel invasions, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States. All political observers at the time understood state power to be a precondition to arming collective action, or at least it was a precondition to arming effective collective action. 
everything about the colonial and revolutionary experience confirmed that idea. State power was a precondition to arming effective collective action. Indeed, the state was so essential to arming coll effective collective action that it could effectively disarm merely by failing to arm. And that I think is in some ways the vital bit of context that is often missing from our debates about what the Second Amendment means. That given, it is little wonder that many at the time in the early 1790s feared that the federal government would abuse its new authority over state militias by doing just that, by effectively disarming, by failing to arm. The Virginian George Mason, who was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, um, but who didn't ever sign the Constitution because the reservations he had about the document prevented him from doing so, um, Mason gave voice to these anxieties. At his state's ratifying convention, Virginia's ratifying convention, Mason objected that the new Constitution gave national authorities, quote, almost unlimited authority over the militia of the several states, whereby, under color of regulating, they may disarm or render useless the militia, the more easily to govern by a standing army. Mason's suggested remedy was, quote, an express declaration that the state governments might arm and discipline their militia. As several of the nation's most distinguished early American historians argued in a brief before the court in 2018, as it was considering Heller, the Second Amendment was crafted to address these and other concerns about reconciling Republican liberty with the need for effective military power. The language of Madison's initial draft is an even clearer indicate, indication that this is in fact what um, the Second Amendment was initially intended to mean. Here's the language of its initial draft. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, semicolon. A well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country, colon. But no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms, comma, shall be compelled to render military service in person. This was not language preoccupied with an individual right to armed self-defense. This was about a collective problem, and it was about the balance of power between the federal and the state governments. Justice John Paul Stevens' dissent in Heller from 2008 correctly identified the discontinuity between the founders' anxieties uh, about guns and about our own anxieties about guns, or our own era's anxieties about guns. He wrote, the Second Amendment was adopted to protect the right of the people to each of the several states to maintain a well-regulated militia. It was a response, he continues, to concerns raised during the ratification of the Constitution that the power of Congress to disarm the state militias and create a national standing army posed an intolerable threat to the sovereignty of the several states. Now, of course, the Heller majority insisted instead on continuity, arguing that the founders were actually a lot like gun owners in our own times. Rather than the balance of federal and state power, rather than militias, rather than standing armies, what really concerned them was protecting an individual right to keep and bear arms for self-defense. Americans are gonna to have to keep living and dying with the consequences of that deadly misinterpretation for the foreseeable future, but, so long as Bruin compels renewed historical inquiry whenever a firearms regulation is challenged, which is all the time now, I believe that the folly of modern Second Amendment jurisprudence is only going to come into sharper and sharper focus, and that that may give us some expectation of a different constitutional interpretation with a different court in the future. Thank you very much. Was on the screen. Sorry, there. I'm on again. Can you see me? Yes. Um, so thank you. Uh, wonderful and learned talk. Um, the bunch of questions. Let me. One question suggests that we could listen to last week's episode of SCOTUS on the um, 
broadcast, on the amicus broadcast, uh, which discusses the upcoming Romney case. Um, maybe you can say a few words about that. Uh, um, it just what it told me what it is, and 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 then the question is, um, there's obviously no, there was no legislation back then about um, uh, wife abusers, people like this having guns, but that was because there was a lot of community regulation. Does that kind of argument, um, does that count as regulation under the under Bruin? So could, could you just comment? I guess ask you to comment on the Romney case. Yeah, Rahimi case. That's, that's how it's pronounced, right? Yeah, Rahimi. Um, so it's a pretty extraordinary case um, for a variety of reasons. I mentioned that you know Heller came in 2008. Um, the next case came in 2010, which was just sort of almost like an addendum to Heller in some ways. The next major case, they waited until 2022. So in that instance, the court, um, you know, it was in no rush to, to hear another major Second Amendment case. So it's it's notable that the court is, a year after Bruin, the court has accepted yet another major Second Amendment case. Um, this case, the Rahimi case, involves a um, a man who had a protective order against him for domestic violence and a very um, clearly established record of violent behavior uh, against others. Um, who, because of that protective order, he was not permitted to. Um, uh, have his guns or purchase guns. I'm sorry, I'm going to forget that detail. Uh, but he sued. Um, and a uh, circuit court found that that law improperly denied him his weapons because the founding fathers did not prohibit um, uh, firearms possession among people that were under um, restraining orders for domestic <laughs> violence. So it, it, one of the things that makes this this ruling so fascinating is um, precisely that it is so unbelievably appalling. And my understanding, not being a legal scholar, um, is that my colleagues who are specialists in Second Amendment law expect the court to overturn the lower court's ruling and to say that it is actually permissible to deny weapons to people that are under um, restraining orders for domestic violence. Um, mainly because it's just very hard, at least again, for these experts to imagine um, uh, five justices wanting to go on the record saying, yeah, domestic abusers ought to have access to guns. Um, the real big fascinating question that um, is outstanding and no one knows the answer to and everyone's desperate to find out is how the court is going to do that. Um, and, you know, I, again, we saw in Bruin that they struck down the law, the New York law regulating concealed carry. But what really made Bruin so consequential was the framework that they introduced. So here too, my, again, my understanding is that um, the court very well may strike down this law and say that it is actually constitutional to deny um, uh, people under indictment for uh, domestic violence or restraining orders for domestic violence, deny them their weapons. The question is how they'll do it. Um, Tom, your, your second question about the regulatory tradition. I guess the so question would, is that it wouldn't regulate it because it would have been a, a violent, just the violence of the peace, you know, disturbance of the peace. Or yeah, some other exactly. There's a lot of community regulation of this sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I was part of a group of historians who um, wrote and signed a brief to the court for Rahimi on, um, you know, on behalf of historians. And uh, I was there for sort of technical reasons about um, you know, firearms technology and so forth and, and about um, disarmament. But the real center of that report was written by a group of very learned colleagues in legal history who made exactly that point, that if we're only looking at you know, searchable compendia of colonial laws to find out how legislators dealt with wife beaters, we're not going to see anything. But that's not how things worked then. And so it's an effort to try to get the justices to see law operating at all kinds of different levels and to make them sensitive to a broader, um, sort of wider landscape of, of legal intervention. So, so this is, I mean, as, I guess asking you um, if you, how optimistic you are, regardless of your opinions, do you think this conservative court will declare any regulation constitutional? Well, you in some sense just answer part of that. Um, yeah. But what's your, if you had to, to I know historians tell it like it was, we don't, you know. Yeah. But, but still, <laughs> Part of me wants to say no, because I'll, whatever I say will be wrong. So, um, uh, but I, you know, I honestly 
find it I find it a little hard to believe that the maximalist vision being pushed by gun rights advocates in the aftermath of Bruin is something that um, a majority is going to sign on to in all cases. Clearly, a lot of laws are going to fall, but I think it's conceivable that they'll uphold um, the ability of states to regulate high capacity magazines. Um, I think it's conceivable that they'll uphold the ability of states to deny weapons to felons, um, to enforce certain kinds of um, restrictions on um, sensitive places. So I think there's a lot of possibilities here. Um, and one of the reasons that Rohini is so fascinating is that I am dying to see, well, assuming they strike down that ruling and they say that you can take this guy's guns away, how they do it will be really fascinating because again, if their basic line is, unless you can find a direct analog, you can't do it. Well, there is no direct analog here. So I'm really excited to see how they're going to square that circle. And a question about continuity and discontinuity again. So in the mid 1970s, the mid 18th century, were there proto-industrial arms manufacturers pursuing commercial interests as is today? I mean, that was there a GM or a Ford of gun makers? or is it a very different kind of supply, supply field? There were definitely things that I think can be appropriately called um, proto-industrial. Um, and your wonderful former student, Priya Sadia, has written eloquently about this in, in the case of Great Britain. Um, so the productive capacity of Europe's largest arms makers in the 18th century just absolutely boggled the mind. I'll just give one little factoid to um, illustrate this. By the middle of the 18th century, Europe might have been exporting as many as a half a million firearms to Africa every year. Um, so the scale of production is astonishing, and this is all being done, you know, before the formal advent of the Industrial Revolution. And it's organized in different ways in different countries. And in, in England, it is um, craft production that's highly specialized and um, uh, disaggregated and, and then overseen by you know huge government contracts often and the contracts of big merchants. It's more centralized in France, but there are these kind of proto-industrial and very high capacity, um, uh, productive capacity elements to gun production in the 18th century. There's not, however, firms of the type, there's no GM for, um, or, or for that matter, Winchester or something. It, those kinds of firms don't yet really exist. So is there any useful comparison between Spanish and Portuguese gun culture in their colonies compared to Britain? Is, I mean, is, are other international, I know you've worked on the South American country. Yeah. Law, so is it? Yeah. Yeah, I do think that those, those, those comparisons are revealing and interesting. I mean, I think one of the things they tell us is they are a reflection of the very different kinds of colonial enterprises in most of those places. So um, in the, the most important colonies of Spain's colonies um, in South and Central America, these are places with large sedentary indigenous populations that have been um, uh, subordinated into uh, you know, a laboring class, basically, almost like a peasantry. Um, there were certain circumstances where um, local authorities would encourage some of uh, you know, some indigenous persons to be armed and serve in militias. But in general, um, this is not something that Spain pursued. So there's far fewer firearms in general and in Spanish American colonies. Now there's a lot of difference. Cuba's not a lot like um, uh, uh, New Spain and places that are have a very significant percentage of enslaved persons um, have to be heavily armed. That's the only way a slave regime functions. Uh, but there's, on, in general, they do not have the same level of firearms ownership um, that we see in British North America. By contrast, in New France, they do. And so that's an interesting kind of, I think the only other example of a new world colony that has comparable levels of firearms ownership. And there it's you know, sort of a similar situation where um, powerful indigenous polities um, and sort of settler colonialism, the constant threat of inter-imperial war and um, a non-trivial amount of, of slavery all kind of come together to encourage widespread firearms ownership. Thank you for a wonderful talk.
Thank you for having me. Thanks for having me. <laughs>